Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome to Bouncing Back, the personal resilience science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I am your host, Joanna. Let's get started. Hello everyone, my name's Joanna and I'm your host today for the Bouncing Back podcast where we talk about everything personal resilience. So I'm super excited for today's episode because not only do we have a holiday special for you, but we also get to talk about New Year's resolutions. Now I love the holiday season, not just because it's Christmas and it's one of my favorite holidays, but because New Year's resolutions are such an interesting topic and I feel like whenever it comes to this time of the year, everyone takes it seriously because it's a chance to start the new year on the right foot. So for today, we will be focusing on our growth mindset for setting resilient goals. And joining me today is Shannon Swales. So Shannon is a clinical psychologist and business owner running group and individual services for people suffering from burnout and other mental health conditions. Her mission is to destigmatize mental health experiences for fellow psychologists and all people. Hi, Shannon. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you, Joanna. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for joining us. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. And so tell us a bit more about who you are and what it is you do. Well, who I am. I always find this question really (laughs) difficult. Well, like I I answer this now that I'm human first and foremost. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) It's a a gentle reminder to myself that I have learnt over the last few years Uh, after burning out myself working as a psychologist for many years before that and needing to take a personal break to look after myself. Uh, But yeah, what I do, I have come back to the profession uh, and uh, yes, I work as a a psychologist, particularly love working with other psychologists, but working with other people who are experiencing burnout or related conditions like vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue. So a lot of our teachers, our nurses, our doctors, anyone on the front line, basically working with vulnerable others. So I suppose I'm, I suppose I'm a person who's passionate about mental health and have been for a long time because of my own personal journey with it, even back in my early twenties, late teens. So, uh, and coming from a generation that didn't speak about it. Uh, so that's, I suppose I'm, pa- I'm, I am passionate about just talking about it and talking about it through lived experience because I think the narrative is so rich of people who've lived it and experienced it and uh and have a wealth of wisdom that comes with that yeah definitely and I find that it's so much easier to relate to people when they've been through the same things as you have and there's so much to go off of and so much to share as well from those lived experiences Mm -hmm. so totally and that's something I I don't think I really realized the richness till my most recent mental health struggles that how important that narrative is and how important that is as a psychologist to learn from those with lived experiences of experiences I haven't had. It whilst yeah. I've had certain mental health experiences, I haven't had them all. Um, and <laughs> that learning um, from those who have and yeah, uh, it's just so important. Yeah. And I feel like having been through different mental health experiences, it's not a bad thing. It doesn't have to be this whole thing of, oh, I'm less of a person because I've gone through this. I feel like it makes you stronger and it gives you so many resources and tools to be able to give other people if they need help as well. So very true. And I think that's why I haven't valued lived experience before because I still experienced way back a lot of shame for experiencing mental health or mental illness. So until I overcame my own shame around that and spoke about and able to speak about my my mental illnesses, it 
I could then really value my own lived experience and that of others. Yeah, and that's so great to hear that you've been able to do that for yourself. And I'm so excited to get into today's into today's topic so you can share all of this lived experience with us and I'm sure it'll be really great. Okay. Great. Well, I've got a little section I like to call, have you met Shannon Swales? So in this section, we just get to know you a bit more with some, you know, more lighthearted little questions. So my first one for you is what is your favorite book? Well, my favorite book, I don't play favorites. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I know. I know that sounds so psychology, psychologist of me. I think I don't play favorites. <laughs> But I do have a favorite genre. Like I tend to really love um, people's stories, which just with what I shared, like memoirs and autobiographies. So um, uh, some recent ones I've read is like Matthew McConaughey's um, Green Lights, uh, Matthew uh, Perry uh, from Friends, his story. It's usually, I, I just, I feel it, they don't necessarily need to, like, I mean, Matthew Perry went through, obviously we know some, hell um and struggled with mental illness with addiction uh so i like listening to those and and reading those kind of stories but matthew mcconaughey uh his was an autobiography up until his 50s and just learning a lot from other humans whatever adversity or you know they may not have i think every human goes through adversity anyway if they've lived 50 years um or even less to be honest uh but yeah I love those so they're just a couple I've read recently yeah yeah as soon as you said like people books I was like I hope she's read Matthew Perry's autobiography because I'm yeah just recently it was yeah bawled my eyes out in the last chapter don't want to spoil like just knowing that he's now passed it was just that last chapter just freaking got me (laughs) um yeah it was it was um hard to take knowing that he's now passed yeah 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 because I'm reading that one right now and I'm not even halfway through but it's so good like I'm not really into autobiographies I'm very much a like fictional type of person um but it's so good and I'm so keen to get through it don't get me wrong I love the fictional as well but yeah (laughs) um but I tend to stick to non-fiction at the moment and people's stories yeah yeah lovely well thank you for sharing that one with us and I haven't heard of Matthew McConaughey's one so I'll have to give that a look yeah I don't know why I end up listening to that one and I, I do a lot of listening audio uh, oh, yeah. audio um it's just easier for me to rather than reading and yeah I, I can't but I, I really found something out of his book too he wasn't someone I was drawn to listening to his story but I actually really enjoyed his story yeah yeah interesting yeah I've always been more of like I'll watch his movies yeah. but I haven't heard much about anything else so yeah, yeah that's an interesting one <laughs> Great. So next one here is what is a movie you have recently enjoyed? I actually, um, I watched yesterday, uh, um, Home Alone 1, the very first one, because uh, I was putting up my Christmas tree and I yeah. um, just a bit of nostalgia and um, watching it back with my partner and my husband as well. Uh, so that's um, just for a, a Christmas holiday movie. Uh, to get me into the spirit so it's just a bit of fun and um yeah well even though he was home alone which was not fun (laughs) uh, but the things he got up to was pretty cool yeah that's so cute and a coincidence because I'm pretty sure the actor Macaulay yes yeah his pronunciation of his name yeah I'm not not tell you but he got a Hollywood one of those star things (laughs) yeah and that's the guy I, I don't know if he has his story out but he's been through addictions himself and I'm not quite sure if uh, most of the time pine addictions is mental illness so I don't yeah what struggles he's been through but I would I would totally read read his story too he's been through a lot so that was really awesome to to see that time uh, that he's I don't know got that um validation I don't know what you call it but verification of of his contribution to to the um I suppose entertainment yeah, and he's such a cute kid as well, like so cute in the movies. He is very cute. It was a very cute kid, yeah. Yes, yeah. Great. Um, next one here is, are you listening to any podcasts at the moment? I'm a little bit of a guilty one here. Like I have a podcast and I, I 
you know, I love being a guest on podcasts to to share you know, wisdom and stuff like that. But listening to them, I often listen to episodes, but not necessarily like a true follower of one. Mm. Um, but I couldn't think of. I mean, there's ones uh, that colleagues of mine have, like "Welcome to Self" by Dr. Haley D. Quinn, who is a supervisor of mine um, pre burnout. And um, the Gentle Living podcast with, uh, oh, and I've forgotten her name, uh, but she's a nurse, <laughs> but um, mental health, mental health nurse, mental health coach. But one way was that I like watching the really uh, small sort of reels and things. And there's a guy called Nurse John um, who does a lot of comedic kind of skits, but of a real issue, which is burnout with nurses. So and Nurse John has his own podcast, which I haven't listened to yet, but I watch his reels um, called Burnt Out Bitches. <laughs> um, he, <laughs> he brings humor, lightness to a very important topic in his industry um, that he works in. But yeah, I really find him quite entertaining. Uh, so Nurse John, yes, I think, yeah, I, should, I, should, I will listen to his podcast eventually. Um, but yeah. Yeah, those, sounds like, those sound like really interesting ones. I'm a bit the same. I don't like even though like I host this podcast I don't actively listen to that many yeah. podcasts um it's Glad more I'm like not alone. no you're definitely not alone <laughs> but it's more of like oh I'll think of a topic I'm super curious about it I'll try to find an episode on it um and that's it kind of for me yeah well that's it too because it's usually a topic or someone has said yeah like this episode of this um and then I'll go and listen to that uh because it's a topic I'm interested in so be an episode here and there hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good way. Yeah, just to get into podcasts as well. And for people who want to get into podcasts, I feel like that's the best way to get into it because you might find something you really like and then become a follower. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, I've got one last question for you, which is, do you have a role model or maybe anyone you look up to? Yeah, well, I was thinking about this. Earlier in my life, it was my sister. I have an older sister. I have a younger sibling as well, but two younger siblings. But she was three years older than me and I looked up to her uh, in my earlier years because she always just grabbed life by the horn. She still does. Uh, and <laughs> she just, you know, goes into it head, head first, doesn't, I'm sure she might think about it, but her confidence, her dedication, her willingness to try what looked like impossible. Like she became a triathlete and um, making, trying to make it into the professional leagues. But she's, yeah, she's just amazing that way. And she still, she still does things like that. Now I'm probably more, I like, I look up to, to Pink. I know that, like, the entertainer. Um, oh. But what I love about her, I mean, she's actually, we're the same age, um, but it's that she's just what's so authentic um, and she's, re she's just real uh, about her struggles as well. So I look up to her in that kind of way that she's always... Um, uh, I don't know if she's always been that way, but she's certainly, as she's grown into her 30s and 40s, just real um, about her struggles. And she doesn't, you know, just paint the pretty picture of what she's achieved and that I just really respect. And, and it's something I've tried to aim to be more and more with myself, to be authentic and, and compassionate. She's so compassionate. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I'm not a massive follower of Pink, but I know that she's a really great role model for her kids. So that's really nice to see. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing those with us, Shannon. Um, I think we're going to jump into our interview questions for today. Um, so, yeah, just to start off, uh, my first question for you is, why do you think resilience is important in our lives? Well, I think it's... I know it's important because the reality of being human is that we will face adversity. We, yeah. we can't avoid that there's going to be times in our life where we will experience pain and suffering. So resilience or the actions of resilience are essential or the tools and actions of um, resilience are essential to be able to face those adversities when they do come about in our lives. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's why it's important. Yeah. And I guess tying that into like today's topic of like New Year's resolutions and resolutions, I feel like resilience really goes hand in hand with that because through setting these resolutions, you're trying to become more resilient. You're trying to figure ways out of like those sticky situations you might be in. 
Yeah, yeah, often they can be. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I so I guess New Year's resolutions, as we know, are a common way for people to set goals and, you know, make a more positive change in their life for the upcoming year. So how do you think that someone can set resilient New Year's resolutions that will lead to growth? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I will admit New Year's resolutions are something that I've had uh, a tumultuous relationship with myself. <laughs> and yeah. and um and finding a way and with my client work as well that um it, it does often come about uh I think to set resilient if we're going to do New Year's resolutions to really set resilient ones first and I think we miss this one all the time we actually need to sit and reflect on the year that was or where we're at like taking stock of yeah, where we're at, like I think or what I see, not only in myself but others, and obviously it's not going to be everyone, that we can be too in a rush to do, to set the goals and to plan and what we're going to do differently. But we don't actually reflect on what we have been doing and where we're at right now. So if we want to set resilient New Year's goals, whether that's at New Year's or any time of year, we've got to reflect, we've got to create that space but usually we don't want to do that dirty work because it, it can be a bit dirty. We may not want to see that, well, for the last year I haven't been working on what I want to be working on. Um, or we may not want to see that we're not in a good space. Um, you know, we may be rushing to the doing because to avoid the the pain in the in the present. So, yeah, my biggest thing if we want to set resilient goals is we need to actually reflect. Um, yeah. And the next thing that I think or I see that is missing is that in the goal setting, we need to connect our goals to what we truly value. Um, like the goal is something that we're going to do that we can tick off the list when we reach it. But values is the richness or the meaning behind that goal. Like I could have the goal, let's face it, a lot of people are going to be wanting to lose weight and you know whatever that might be. <laughs> um, I know that's a very you know typical, but it's, you know, losing weight. But well, what's meaningful about that for you? Or, well, you know, that the richness behind it. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've come to in my, I, I mean, I don't even set the goal of weight loss anymore. It might, it's more to do um, looking after my body and my mind. Yeah, well, what's rich and important behind that is that I value my health, I value my well-being, because um, I know when that is well, I can do the work that I do, I can um, the relationships that I have, I can just be better for other people. So, what's the richness behind your goals? What's the value? That's another, um, and and that would help with the resilience of those New Year's resolutions as well. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, that's yeah, and I think that's a really important point that you bring up because like news resolutions are great, but I always have had my hesitancy with it just because people are like, okay, news resolution, they think about it on the spot and they're like, okay, I'm going to do this and it's going to happen as soon as it hits the 1st of January. And it's always pretty unrealistic because I, and I'm guilty of this too, we don't take time to think about like what we actually want and how this reflects on us as a person, what our values are, what we've been through during the year. And I think when we make those really impulsive types of goals, it's harder to achieve them because they're not actually rooted in something realistic or something that, you know, we can, you know, effectively work towards. Yeah, you bring up a really important point there, realistic. Like the expectations we often hold around our goals are unrealistic. And sometimes they're somebody else's goals, not our own. Yeah. Um, so that expectation is, yeah, something really important and, and will help with the resilience of your goals as well uh, is to actually ask ourselves, are these expectations realistic and are they mine or society's standards, you know, of what I should should or must be achieving? Uh, so yeah, another vital area of exploration when we're setting goals, our community's yeah, resolutions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something we only learn as we like grow older or as we have more conversations like this, because I think I've been trying to do new year's resolutions for like the past, maybe four years now. 
And they're always goals like, okay, I'm going to run every day. I'm going to go to the gym every day. I'm going to, you know, hike 10 kilometers or something like that. And it's so unrealistic, but I see other people doing that. And then I'm like, I can do that. I don't have to work up to it kind of thing. So just acknowledging your capabilities and what your strengths are, I feel like it's really important. Definitely. Yeah. Just comparison is such a killer. Um, I always say to my clients, apples and oranges, people, apples and oranges, and actually all the fruits when we don't know what's going on in their life. Or, or their personality or all the you know, things that make up them. So we really can't compare ourselves to other people. It's just not realistic. And we've got to come back, as you said, Joanna, like come back to ourselves and what what is it that I want? What's, what's rich to me? And expectations that meet where you're at as well and what's capable for you and your strengths and limitations. Yeah, we all have them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And... What would you say to someone who's, you know, taken this time to reflect, acknowledge all these different things and, you know, they're finding it hard to stick to their, you know, resolutions. Do you have any advice for how people can maintain their commitment? Yeah, I think one of the, and I don't do this really well myself, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> um, so I'll just put that out there, the human in me, uh, we all have her or um, him, uh, that just you know to pencil time in to review like at certain stages throughout um or if you find yourself there stuck and you're you're not progressing with your with your resolutions that use that as a time to review and reflect like what's going on here that's making um that's making this harder for me like it could be that okay maybe our uh goal was unrealistic or maybe something's happened, adversity has hit. Maybe there's some extra load from work or from home. Maybe, you know, um, and when I say load, it can be a physical, emotional, or even mental load or all, all the above. And that's going to impact our ability to stick to our, our goals, even if they were realistic three months ago, but they're not now. We, we are like, where like just because it might have been a realistic goal three months ago it may not be now because circumstances have changed so take the time to review but be flexible like I, I often go like this like, <laughs> my clients, like I don't know those flexi boards someone who knows materials better would <laughs> like a plastic flexi but not like a steel pole that's really rigid we can't be rigid with our goals because uh, life life is fluid um, so we've got to, we've got to roll with it. And sometimes that means in that review, when we're stuck, we might need to lower our expectations. Um, yeah. Uh, or we might, or maybe, yeah, spending time to review, but knowing that part of that might be that things have changed, um, in our life and we need to change with it. Uh, we need to change our goals, uh, to suit the changes. But look, yeah, definitely reviewing is is important in creating a space to, again, stop and reflect what's going on here that's making it harder. Uh, and I think this just something popped in my head that's important. Whenever we're reviewing or even reflecting way back when we're setting our goals, one of the really fundamental skills we need that makes things resilience is to be mindful. Now, I know we heard that buzzword a hundred times, but <laughs> yeah. the reason it is so important is that we all have a mind that is quick to judge us, quick to compare ourselves to others. You know, you're not good enough. You're not doing enough. Look, Joe Blow over here can, you know, climb, you know, I mean, do 10K run or something. You know, why can't you? Um, we need to come at ourselves with being present, being curious rather than judgmental. So the opposite of judgmental is being curious. Uh, and even, I mean, this is not part of mindfulness, but being compassionate, you know, being kind, uh, but that's part of dropping the judgment and being, um, curious about what's going on here. So I'd really encourage everyone when you're reviewing or reflecting wherever you are in your new year's resolution process is bring mindfulness to it. And that's an art form. It's a skill. It takes a lot of practice. And I speak from experience <laughs> like, um, and working with people on this skill. Um, mindfulness is key. Compassion is key uh, to build resilient goal, uh, resilient yeah, goals, New Year's resolutions. Yeah. yeah. So sorry, even in the review status, we need to come at it mindfully, compassionately, 
And these are not easy skills to develop. They're very important to resilience, uh, but they take time and practice. Yeah, that's really interesting because you mentioned, you know, this idea of taking off the load and also, you know, working with other people. And I feel like we think of New Year's resolutions as something we have to do in isolation, that it's just us and we just have to, you know, focus just on what we're doing and we can't involve anyone else. So what would you say to that, you know, for people who have that perspective? How can we feel okay with taking accountability for seeking support from other people to help achieve these goals? Oh, uh, yeah, like uh, I'm so glad you brought that up because I was <laughs> someone who I, I called it actually, I wrote a journal entry, I, I keep a journal, uh, and way back when I was burnt out and going through my recovery and therapy and everything, uh, I called it toxically independent. And I thought, I coined that, but then I did a Google and no, <laughs> it's already out there. And it's just like, yeah, it's toxic in the sense that at some point it doesn't help you. Yeah, You know, we are creatures who are, we're social creatures, obviously to varying lengths. Again, apples, oranges, kiwi fruit, we're all different, <laughs> unique <laughs> um, individual beings and our social yeah. needs, but we are social creatures. And especially when we're trying to do something that's hard for us to do, we even need our our, our tribe, our people, um, our collective even more. But a lot of us find it extremely hard to do it. And I was one of them to ask for help. And I, somewhere in my upbringing and, and no one's to blame and, you know, culture, culture, it just seeped into me that to ask for help is weak, that, and to do it all yourself is strong. Somehow that seeped in. No one actually said that out loud to me. I think it was just an insidious seeping in thing and I think we live in a culture well I know we do um that has perpetuated more of this toxic individual as well um so we we don't do things collectively uh but we that is a big part of the answer we need to reach out and ask for help uh there's no I'm just trying to think well how do you do that and I think because there can be it's there can be some, uh, just working with people on this, I know there's some extreme fears to to doing that. So it might be that we actually need to get help from a psychologist to work through those fears because that it, you know, there'll be people listening where it's not so easy to do that. And if you're stuck, you're finding that really hard. Definitely working with you know, a health professional like psychologists, social workers, counsellors, um, we can help with that and explore that fear with you. Um, for some others, it might be, you know, just that leap and, and, and giving it a go. Uh, but yeah, whatever the, yeah, definitely reaching out and asking for help. You'll find your tribe um, and finding those people. And I think what helps actually, I'm, as I'm talking out loud, I'm thinking of one of the things that really helped me in connecting with other people now is because I know my values and what's important to me when I'm connecting with other people, getting help from them. It's, I think for, I, I like to be challenged though and have other people, but I think people with yeah. liked values, like if I'm working, like I've just recently connected with a, an accountant you know, for my business. And it was like, one of the things I found in our initial interview was he was very authentic. And I know that that's a value of mine. So that was one of the reasons I went with him. There was an authenticity about him. And so I think when someone's reaching out for help with their New Year's resolutions, if you know what you value and what's important to you, you'll find that in the people you connect with to get help with this goal that you have. And yeah, that value connection will help you. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense or yeah. No, that definitely does. I feel like you do gravitate towards the people that reflect more of yourself and the values that you have and you're able to forge a stronger connection because of that. And it's really interesting because I feel like when we think of goals, um, we think of it as this like really individual race, like a race to, you know, do this and be better than anyone else. And that's why we can't involve other people in, you know, trying to work towards our goals because we see see this as sort of like a competition that like if I can do this better and if I can achieve my goals quicker than other people that must make me more successful so I gotta block it all out and I just gotta focus on what I'm doing which I feel like can be a pretty toxic mindset oh definitely and that's another thing that is bred into us culturally um and I can't speak on my you know my cultural upbringing very uh you know in 
Australian um, middle class, I suppose working class, um, Caucasian white, uh, that and female, you know, competitive. It was all about competing and yeah, and that is just recipe. And no one's at fault. Like, I mean, we yeah. can here, but um, it's recognizing that we don't have to go along with that anymore. And I mean, that's come with me with time. And I think with age, I'm now in my mid, almost mid forties. Um, it's taken a while to be able to step back from those cultural systemic kind of learnings and realize well that doesn't work and it's not okay and yeah. um for me or for anybody else and get off that competitive uh path um because and that's what I like about pink you know it's something else that I've learned from her is yeah. you know we 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 get more successful with collectively helping each other out um than we do on our own so yeah, if you want to be successful, find a tribe. <laughs> and 100%. I'm learning that the hard way because <laughs> yeah. I did it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like everyone's guilty of that. And it kind of reminds me of when you're in school or when you're in school, when like your teacher would say, it's always better to share your ideas than to keep it to yourself. I can't remember exactly how they would say it, but they're always like, don't keep your ideas to yourself. We're always better when we share and when, you know, we're trying to help each other out because you're not going to do better just keeping all the good ideas to yourself kind of thing. I don't know. Did you ever have that experience? No, um, I was just like, oh, that's so beautiful. Um, maybe I did, but it didn't sit with me or maybe I didn't hear it enough. I think with my era, I'm Generation X and uh, that, and I don't know if it's, you know, changed much now. It doesn't sound like it has in terms of, well, we're still assessed individually, aren't we, academically? Yeah. You know, we're still like, oh, here's someone who's got like the A's and then, you know, because sometimes you see everybody's marks, not always, yeah. or you talk to each other. So there's this, we're still assessed individually and you know, people of certain marks will get certain doors will open for them. And even at work, you know, promotions for people who reach certain KPIs, you know, like performance indicators rather than, well, what about all these other characteristics or, uh, you know, things like, I don't know, creativeness or their soft, well, what gets called soft skills, like how they interact with their team, you know, it, it still goes on these like numbers and performance indicators that, yeah, you know, yeah. Anyway, I'm probably going off on a tangent, but yeah, like, <laughs> um, you know, I didn't. Um, it was it. Schooling is, I think, got a lot to answer for, and again, no one's fault. Yeah. Um, just the way things are assessed, that that can set us up to be competitive. Yeah, for sure. And I think I'm starting to remember what it was. I think it was because everything's graded on a bell curve. They're like, share your ideas because if the best person does even better, then it brings you all up. So sharing your ideas brings up the collective as opposed to just keeping it to yourself. So I, I love think, that teacher. <laughs> yeah, I know. Teacher. So I, I think that was it. And I never really listened to it. I was always like, I'm not listening to you. I'm just doing my own thing. I'm not helping anyone else. Like, I, yeah. So it's really interesting. No, and I, I think even if I did have that, I think I'd be similar to yourself because certain personality traits that, again, I didn't have a cho choice of, I was born with them, that sort of <laughs> set me up to be um, quite insular to start with. And also I was quite a socially anxious kid, so that closed me down even more. I wouldn't share ideas because I'd be too nervous someone would think it was shit. <laughs> like, so, yeah. like, yeah. oh, crap, I'm not good enough, you know. And yeah. So that, you know, a teacher could be, yeah. So there's so many other things that can make you become quite individualistic and, and competitive. Um, yeah, as well. Yeah. And just like taking a step back, I'm like looking at, you know, this idea of goal setting and news resolutions and how we're talking about this idea of individualism and, you know, working as a collective and kind of seeing how those ideas come together, which is really interesting because, yes, goal setting is a very individual thing, but we're trying to branch out and we're trying to involve all these different resources and we're trying to, you know, maximize our capability to achieve these goals. And that comes from things outside of us as well. Exactly. Because like, like if I know I'm using the lose weight again, I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh, let, okay, like um, increasing our activity, getting active, like, let's yeah. put it that way. Like, okay, well, maybe we want to get active by learning how to dance, but we don't know how to dance and we'd like to learn that. Well, okay, yeah. going to join a, a, a 
you know, a dance academy or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> or going along to a gym where there's a dance class or, or a friend who does it already and you feel comfortable going with. But, yeah, we only know what we know. And yeah. um, and sometimes it might be if you're anxious about doing something and going with a friend who, you know, you trust and, and you know, who knows you're a bit anxious as well can help you get over that line to reach your goal. You know, it's all these um yeah, to help you get there, we may need the knowledge and skills and support of another person or um, sister, you know, team yeah, as well. Yeah, 100%. And do you have any resources or anything you might recommend for people to kind of help, you know, their goal setting and help with reaching out and, you know, being able to find the help that they need? Yeah, I was thinking about this. Um, I I always think of, uh, and people probably heard this one, but the, uh, the smart goal setting is certainly a fundamental framework to have. If yeah. you do a quick Google search, you'll find, um, and there's some variations, but it's a really lovely framework to help you set goals um, in a very effective and resilient way. Um, the other resources I'd really recommend are about building those fundamental skills I talked about earlier around values and around uh, mindfulness and compassion, uh, which definitely uh, not only help building resilient New Year's resolutions, but also help your mental health in general. <laughs> uh, so everyone can benefit from these. So I, oh, there's a mountain of resources, but what comes to mind in the compassion field is certainly uh, Kristen Neff, who was the first person who introduced me to compassion for self. She's got a lovely website. So if you Google Kristen, Kristen Neff, you'll find a lot of free resources and books and podcasts to go to to build your compassionate skills. For um, mindfulness, I, I utilize acceptance and commitment therapy, which goes into the values as well. So the first book I ever read on that was The Happiness Trap, um, so by Dr. Russ Harris. And that book introduced me to these fundamental skills of mindfulness, to values. So these things will will help with your goal setting, but they they I suppose tra- um they expand across a lot of like that will help you with your mental health in general. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully that is helpful. Um, but yeah, act the happiness trap. Dr. Russ Harris, he's got a lot of stuff. He's got, I think, a YouTube channel as well. He's got lots of books. Actually, the book that I was my favorite of his is The Reality Slap, um, which I, oh, actually, no, he calls it The Reality. Yeah, The Reality Slap. I'm quite sure that's the name of the book. Um, But again, building these skills to be able to, um, you know, yeah, be able to reach out goals in, in life as well. It definitely will help with that as well as lots of other things. But yeah, they would be my, my go-tos. I'm just wondering if I've forgotten any of them. Um, but definitely that SMART goal acronym. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those with us, Shannon. And I feel like when we research some of these resources, we'll probably go through a rabbit hole and find a bunch of different things as well. So that's what's great about technology as well. And I think Dr. Russ Harris actually often talks to, and even Kristen Neff around this time of year and setting New Year's resolutions and things like that. They'll have if you Google their names and that, they'll have some helpful tips around bringing compassion to that or bringing the ACT stuff to setting goals and use resolutions because that's the kind of thing they do as practitioners and researchers. Well, Kristen F is a researcher and practitioner. Dr. Russ Harris is a practitioner. Um, yeah, they, they will help with those specific areas as well. So definitely... Yeah, my tip for listeners would be yeah, Google those two things together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Well, thank you for that again. Um, I'll definitely look at some of those as well. I'm always looking for little self-help books or things that help with mindfulness because that's something I'm trying to practice as well. Yeah, definitely. And before I mentioned, you know, how, you know, New Year's resolutions are something that I've been trying to do for about four years now. And I feel like this idea of failure also comes into everything because if New Year's resolutions are something you've been trying to do for a while and you haven't had the most success with them, I feel like this fear of failure can really come in and really inhibit, you know, your ability to, you know, see your New Year's resolutions through. So how can we combat this fear? 
Yeah, um, fear, fear, Thalia. Um, again, my my facial expressions are showing. Like I, I'm very <laughs> familiar with this guy because I've yeah. experienced it myself. Um, in lots of areas. Like one of the things I mean, we can't stop the fact that we might fear failure. Uh, we can recognize it and acknowledge it, and that's really important because sometimes we can get really frustrated at the fact that we are feeling that or, or experiencing that that failure and that fear. First and foremost, it's important to just acknowledge that you're human, yeah. and and failing sucks, and we, you know, and and we we feel we fear experiencing it again and failing again. But the fundamental shift in this that is important to get to is being able to see any setback and language is important. So if changing the word failure to setback works for you, do it because <laughs> um, language is very, very powerful. So yeah, swap that word failure to setback um, or any other word that feels a little bit better in your body and doesn't strike fear. But seeing the set as an opportunity to learn. And I know a lot of us have heard this before, but find it hard to do that. But that is the reality that, well, not the reality. The reality is that we will fail. <laughs> I know that sounds weird. That we'll, <laughs> we'll experience setback. Yeah. I feel like I'm going around in circles. But fear, when we feel, when we're fearful of something, what our body wants to do is avoid that very thing. It sees it like it's life-threatening. Like if we fear something, it is our brains are seeing it as this is a saber-toothed tiger coming to eat me. Yeah. So when we're under fear, we have two choices. We either fight that very thing that we're fearful of or we run the hell away. So this is where we can actually stop doing, you know, trying to achieve something because we're just avoiding it because I don't want to get to that failure. So your, your mind is cued to either run or fight. Neither of them are going to work for you here. So you're going against your biology, which is possible <laughs> um, by acknowledging that this is fearful, but it's not a saber-toothed tiger. It can't kill me if I fail. My mind and body thinks it's going to, but you're not. None of us have died from failing at something. Yeah. You know, well, you know, fun that we've lived from. I though. mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, some things that we try out, there's a danger, um, of course. I'm just thinking of like face jumping or some shit like that. Yeah. But look, putting that aside, like, you know, that we've got to see this. It's not a saber-toothed tiger, you know, letting the breath, you know, your mind and body know that, look, this is not, and I can look at this as an opportunity to learn instead what went wrong there, what went right. You know, we can explore that attempt, that setback, and look at what we can learn. I do this like in my work, I often um, would get through a client session and my brain would be like, I failed, I didn't do well there, I didn't do enough and I'd be in this like fight and like with myself that I should have done better. Now I take a breath <laughs> and I kind of go, okay, there's my fear brain going off, she's yeah. fighting, she's you know, probably even sometimes thinking, oh, why am I doing this work? And so I just take a breath, recognize that that's fear talking, I'm okay is not a life or death situation and then I switch to what can I learn from this session what went well there what went right we can do this with our goals that um you know when we're setting them um well like I know even before like it's like if I do well not if when I have a setback so expect it <laughs> when I have a setback what we'll do is we'll review we'll yeah. look at what went well there we'll look at what didn't and we will learn from that experience. We'll maybe get some help. Maybe we needed, you know, a, a personal trainer or something. We needed a friend or, you know, uh, we needed to do some more research on that thing and and then go from there. But, yeah, I hope that makes sense. So I no. went around the circles there a bit for a second. No, that definitely did. And I feel like when our brains, you know, feel that we're moving towards something that has caused us to fail or has been a setback for for us before in the past it'll like stop us from going there and be like okay don't go there go somewhere else and I feel like it is important to you know break through that and be able to face those things again and know that you can do better um you just have to revisit it like you said and just notice what went well what didn't go well um and also like we started this episode with talking about reflection and taking time to reflect upon things I feel like that can really help and it doesn't have to be something you have to be afraid of because at the end of the day like 
yeah people might judge you for it but like it doesn't really matter because you know they're not the ones that are going to be reaping the rewards if you do succeed it's going to be yourself yeah and that that fear of other people judging as well it's such a, a hard thing and um and because the reality is some people will yeah and some people uh, look uh, you know and easy said than done uh uh, you know, dealing with people who do that, but often it says a hell of a lot more about them than it does of you, you know, and often because most people who judge outwardly at others, they're judging themselves inwardly and it's just projecting outwards yeah. um, and that's their shit to deal with. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and, yeah, because you're the one who benefits from what you're doing for yourself and you matter and, um, and you, yeah, don't waste your energy on, on other people who are just out to judge because they're not, ready to deal with their own stuff exactly and that's where I feel like the whole individualism can come in you know just focus on what you're doing use the things outside of you that are helpful not the judgment or anything like that but the actual productive resources that you have definitely because we can and that's where compassion is so important with ourselves we can have that non-judgmental relationship with ourselves which helps us then less likely to care what other people think yeah. but also yeah and, and that's where that individual is really great if we have a really beautiful relationship with ourselves and that we then will also include people in our lives who who have got that compassion as well for us and and yeah and so whoever we do tap into will be these kind of people that lift us up yeah definitely and I feel like that's a beautiful way to put it as well um so I have one last little question in this section for you and that are that is if you could offer three top tips for listeners to help them embark on a successful New Year's resolution path, what would they be? Yeah, um, well, carving out space and, and I'm going to say that again, carving out space because we're all very good at going, I don't have time for this. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> It is a conscious choice to carve out space to do that reflection, to reflect, set those New Year's goals if that's what you you choose to do. And I'm not a person who says everyone has to do this, but if it's something you feel pulled towards, carve out that time and that space to really reflect, set and plan um, the the year goals ahead, uh, wherever that might be. You know, December, January is never too late, Um, July (laughs) to, to do them. Yeah. Um, the second one is finding your tribe. I, I call it tribe. Some of my clients or people I know will call it their people. Um, yeah. but that the community, cause community is key. I've learned this through my toxic independence, um, that, <laughs> um, community is key to reach our goals, you know, um, and just life. Um, so finding that tribe that will help you get there. Um, and third one is make sure they are your goals and not someone else's. We talked about that a bit earlier. Uh, you know, whose goals are these? Um, you know, making sure they're your own and not someone else's, that's very important. If that's where your values and understanding what those, what values are and what they are for you will help with that one too to help you go really reflect whose, whose goals are these. Yeah. Are they mine? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like it's so easy to be influenced by what other people say about us and then take that information and perceive that as what we need to change about ourselves and convince ourselves that those are our goals when really we have a different vision for who we want to be. And I think it's, and I might be generalizing this, but I think it's harder in our 20s to be able to do that uh, because yeah. we're still finding how we, we're finding ourselves, you know. I mean, I'm yeah. still finding that. Well, when I say finding myself, I like to think that I'm learning about myself. Yeah. I'm learning. But I think, yeah, in our 20s, because we're just, we're, we're experimenting. We're, we're doing a lot of things, you know, to explore, to find out, yeah, what, what do I like? What don't I? And so I think it's harder in the 20s to do this. And I just want to acknowledge that. Um, like I'm, I'm speaking from a woman in her 40s now, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, my 30s, I think I was still figuring it all out as well. Like I said, I'm still figuring things out about myself. But yeah. I think it's just a lot harder when you're younger. Um, but hey, I might be wrong about that. Uh, and everyone has a different path. You know, we're all different fruits, um, so to say. Uh, but yeah, I just think it's harder when we're younger because we're still try- we're still experimenting, still figuring things out. 
Yeah, I can definitely attest to that. Like I'm in my 20s and I feel like I'm such a sponge in the sense that like I just absorb everything around me and sometimes it's a bit overwhelming to know like who I want to be, like where I want to go when I've got all these different things around me telling me who I should be, what I should aspire to be like. And yeah, it's definitely a process of trying to find yourself and it's very confusing at times. Yeah, that's the word, confusing. I've had younger clients say that to me, confusion um, with all of that, yeah. And I, I think I was just thinking one of the things that could be good there is the word that you were using, and I think I did too, experiment. You know, I don't need to know. I mean, I know it's nice to know, <laughs> you know, and it's like, I mean, because, yeah, I was grasping at that too. And people expect you to know. I mean, what yeah. do we ask the poor young people, like, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, oh, no. Me as a young person was like, I freaking have no clue. Yeah. And I, I didn't go to, yeah, anyway, I didn't become a psych till later in life. It's like I didn't know, but there wasn't room to not know and to be okay to experiment. But I think that's fundamentally what we need to hear more of for younger people and, you know, in the age group you're in is that it's okay to not know, to experiment, that's what, uh, and even if you're in your 40s and you don't know, experiment. You know yeah. that's how we find out as humans. You know, you watch babies, little toddlers. They work out what's good and what's not through their senses. You know, they pick up a pile of dirt and eat it. You know, they taste <laughs> it. Okay, that's not great. <laughs> but, you know, they're learning through experimenting with with their their world. Yeah. That's what we need to come back to, and that and we need to get the message that it's okay. You know, so. Maybe your New Year's resolutions have their experimenting quality to it, you know. Um, yeah. Maybe it's about experimenting with something this year. Yeah, coming. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot of trial and error and I hate when people ask me, so what do you want to do? And it often comes from like older relatives or they're always just like, so what are you going to do when you grow up? And I'm like, I'm just trying to figure out what I'm doing right now and I feel like all that stuff will come together once I've figured out like who I want to be and where I want to go. Yes, and I, I've tried to as an older relative now is not ask my uh, not ask my nieces and nephews. I, I try because yeah, and they they do it with beautiful intent, of course. Yeah. Um, but it's just providing a different yeah. Like, what do you like doing? You know, or, yeah. what are you up to these days? You know, what's happening in your world? Or yeah, trying to because I've got nieces and nephews that range from three to twenty five. So. Um, yeah, so just trying to create a different culture so that they can they can feel comfortable um, doing whatever they need to do. Yeah, like exactly. Yourself. Yeah, that's a really great way to put it, and also so great to hear that you're putting that into practice. Trying, yeah, trying, <laughs> trying. To, trying. Yeah, yeah. That's what's important. Yeah, trial and error, trying even with our New Year's resolutions, definitely. Exactly. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, we've got another section here, which is our practices and habits. So here we're going to take a bit more of a personal lens and talk about a practice that you might recommend personally to help cultivate personal growth. Yeah, well, this is an age old one. And I know some people cringe at this, but journaling. Um, mm. I I even cringed at it, to be honest. <laughs> but journaling is what I recommend uh, or one of the, there's so many, but journaling is definitely one that I'd recommend. Uh, yeah, uh, for and and it just offers so many elements. But for me, when I consciously chose to journal, which was when I burnt out, it was because I found I was completely well, not as connected with myself as I thought I was in terms of how I was feeling, what I was thinking, what was going on in my body, in my world. And so journaling was a tool for me to reach my goal of uh, connecting with myself and learning about me moment to moment. And I could do that through journaling. Yeah, definitely. And journaling is quite underrated. I feel like people hear about it and then they're like, no, not going to do that too much effort. So let's break it down a bit. Um, do you recommend doing it during a certain time of the day? How do people figure this out? Yeah, well, I actually delved into the literature just to see what uh, like research and stuff was done and what they're recommending. But, uh, and it's a little bit like, to be honest, they, there's not enough research on it to really go, okay, this is what works. But through my work with clients and with myself and, and anyone that I've chatted to who do this practice, it's finding out a time or day that works for you. 
for me, I'm a morning person. I'm more alert consciously in the morning than I am in the afternoon. So it's about picking a time or day that you are more alert, more grounded, more regulated. Um, I mean, there's things you can do to help support that. But yeah, for me, it was morning. And again, life, right? We have other responsibilities. So also we have to think about where we will carve out space for that too. And again, I'm using the word carve out because if we say we don't have time for that, which is a reality, it is about carving out that time if we're, um, if it's important enough for us to do. But yeah, uh, where you feel like for my husband, it'll be nighttime. Not that he yeah. journals, but if he wants to, <laughs> he's more alert at that time, like 7 p.m., he's alert and he's up to a lot later than I am. But for me, it's like 7 a.m. or even when I was unwell because I wasn't working, um, it was more about 10 a.m. Um, but now it'd be around 7 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you think journaling has improved your perception in life? Uh, it's definitely, it's helped me, yeah, gain insight into myself and how I relate with the world and with people. So it's helped, I suppose, yeah, uh, like my perception in terms of being more open because when I wasn't connected with myself, I would get, or even now, because I still have moments, of course, that my my worldview can become quite narrow and I just focus on the negative aspect of something, like of someone else's behavior or my own. And I can just, my brain, because it's, you know, my emotions are going off, is just seeing the bad. Uh, so writing it out really helps me to step back and actually really see the bigger picture and see more of a balance. Uh, so it, it creates more of an open perspective of myself, but also of others and, you know, maybe events or, or things that are going on in my life. It usually is about my own behavior or my, or other people's behaviors, um, yeah. that I tend to struggle or have difficulty with and, and journal about. Um, so it just brings up more of an open perspective, I suppose, on those situations. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And do you, how do you find the motivation and, you know, the ambition to keep journaling? Because sometimes I feel like it's a very, oh, I can't be bothered doing that. I'd rather just sit and not think and do something that's totally just like doesn't require brain power. Yeah, because it, it is, journaling is a tough one to do because it does, especially if we're journaling in this way in terms of what's going on for me, a lot of us don't want to face inwards because there may not be stuff there that way we want to connect with. Because yeah. it means connecting with everything and anything, the bad, the good, the in-between. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, journaling can, yeah, is, is tough in that way, but rewarding as well. Uh, but, you know, very rewarding. And I feel like I've lost oh, sorry, the, oh, the motivation, yeah, how to keep that motivation. <laughs> but, you know, um, two things I come back to is, is know the why you're doing it. So that's your values. What's rich about journaling for you? Why are you doing this for yourself? Yeah. So the fact that I set that intention way earlier I keep reminding myself of that. Whenever I feel demotivated to do it, it's like, whoop, what's that why? Oh, connection with self. And also because I have lived experience of being totally disconnected from me and where that led to, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big motivating force because we're like, ooh, you became mentally ill. That was not fun. Um, so that's a reinforcer to me as well that I've had that lived experience of what that felt like. Mm. So that keeps me. But the other important thing is I'm very flexible like if I don't feel up to it and I don't want to engage in it, day, I don't should myself into it. I go, yeah. okay, well, you know, I connect back to the value, but it's like, you know what? Okay, not today. Or the other thing I've, I've changed up as well is I change how I do it. I used to be very much writing it out and I got kind of really tired of that. So I changed it up and I started doing like um, videos and I, yeah. I spoke and I spoke it out rather than writing it. And now I draw it out. And I'm no artist. <laughs> you don't need to be an artist to do journaling through yeah. art. But now I draw it out with scented crayons. <laughs> it's like oh. I, love, you know, I accidentally picked up scented crayons. I actually like crayons as a, a drawing thing and because they're soft and colourful. But I accidentally picked up the scented candles, uh, candles, crayons. But I love <laughs> it. And now I'm not buying any other crayons except the scented because it, it works for me but yeah be flexible change things up maybe it's just it's a bit like exercise sometimes you need to change up how you're doing it because you just get bored of one 
And I'm someone who gets bored easy, I yeah. think. Yeah. And I used to see that as a bad thing. No, work with yourself. If you're getting yeah. bored of one medium, change it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. I love love the scented crayons. That's so <laughs> cute. It's, it's such yeah. a good idea as well. Make so things not fun. A, thank yeah. you to the brand or whoever that created those. I like, think it's amazing. I wouldn't have thought, thought of that, but it's a brilliant thing. And they're sold in the children's like new. I'm like, you adults, we need that too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Groundbreaking. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's so important to work with yourself, like you said, because I used to journal in like my notes app and I used to like actually write everything, like not write, type everything in. But now I've become very like, I'll just use the voice, like the, I don't know what it's called voice memo thingies um but on notes so like I'll speak out speak it out instead of typing it because I find that I can express myself better and I actually don't get frustrated t- trying to type everything out yeah and just go work with yourself yeah if whatever like there's and this is when I went into the literature on journaling and I actually ended up doing a podcast episode on it just to share what I learned from that um you know deep dive into the research they talked about all these different ways to journal so yeah there's not just the traditional writing you know, there's yeah. so many different ways. And and one of the things I just want to share with the audience is don't worry about grammar, spelling or your writing oh, yeah. ability because it's for you. No one else is seeing this. So, you know, don't worry about those things. Same with your art if you're drawing it out. <laughs> no one's seeing it. Yeah. And if you want to share your journals, go for it. But, um, yeah, no one's seeing it. You, yeah, draw to your heart's content. You know, write all the wrong grammar in the world. Who cares? And I'm no grammar like I'm not great (laughs) yeah yeah and I find that that's why I do the voice feature because it might not make sense when it's being written out but that's how I say it that's how I express it and I can be more passionate when I'm speaking as opposed to when I'm typing and I can see all the typos and you know my keyboard trying to auto correct them and everything like that um but yeah we don't have to feel like by changing the way we do things we're becoming more lazy it's just adapting to what works for us That narrative we plan ahead, yeah, it's got nothing to do with laziness. You're working with the human, your human first and foremost. And we may get bored or, yeah, whatever. Like, yeah, that narrative just, again, come from somewhere and you're not lazy, you're you're human, stuff's going on. Maybe that's making it harder to meet this goal of journaling. And, like, I used to sometimes do it. I don't do it daily. I know some people who do it daily. Uh, I I do it whenever I need to now back then when I was really unwell I did it uh well again when I needed to but it just ended up being pretty much every day because yeah there was a lot going on um but um I hard and fast rules don't work for me um so I I don't really set uh I just like when I'm stuck that's when I'll go to it yeah and that works for me. Um, you just got to find out yeah, what works for you. And sometimes, yeah, working with someone else who, or talking to others, because there's a lot of us who journal out there, <laughs> to find what works for you and experiment, trial and error, like you mentioned before, showing up. Yeah. Yeah, mm. exactly. Well, thank you again for sharing that with us. I feel like now we've just got so many different little things we can try. And yes, they've been mentioned a lot before. I'm sure people listening have heard of these strategies, but it's just good to hear it from another person's perspective and someone who's also tried doing it so thank you for sharing that with us my pleasure okay well we are now at our last little section for today shannon so this is our open mic so opening the floor up for you to talk about anything that you would like to um oh so many things but i feel like i got so much across today which is really really valuable uh well i feel yeah valuable to to the audience but something that i did uh you know think about And we have spoken about a lot too today um, that I think just bringing to, uh, I can't remember, but like I think there's these two words, time and space, that we often don't create time and space in our lives to uh, things like rest, create, play, connect. Like I feel like a lot of the times when we're setting goals and particularly around New Year's resolutions, that they're often a lot focused on things we have to obtain, you know, get to. And and they might be things that are a sign of success. Like it might be like, you know, to do with job promotions or health-wise. And these are all important and, and uh, 
you know, and I imagine value things for a lot of people out there to to tend to, but they're they're like goal outcome focus, something we can tick off the list once we reach, you know, achieved it. It's like, you know, attending gym three times a week. Okay, tick, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, got those blood sugar levels down, tick, you know, or achieved that promotion at work, tick, or finished universities, tick. Um, whatever those things might might be, they're goal orientated. But something that we also need as human beings that I really feel need to be on our New Year's resolution list. And that is creating time and space for things that are non-goal orientated, but very, very fundamental to our health and well-being. And these are things like playtime, play for play's sake, like our kids do. You know, watching kids on a playground, they don't have a goal in mind. They're just, you know, <laughs> having fun on the monkey bars or, yeah. you know, going down that slide. Watch you, if you have kids or your nieces and nephews or just watch <laughs> you know, observe, um, curiously, some, you know, kids, like we as adults need that still. It's, um, I've forgotten the researcher, but they've done research on this. We need to carve time out for play. Connect is another one. We are human, as uh, social creatures, varying degrees, definitely. And who we choose to socialize with is important, but we need time to connect and not because we're doing something for someone else or they're doing something for us, but just connection for connection's sake. And we definitely need rest. Um, we see rest as in our society as lazy or some thing that we only do once we've gotten everything else done on our to-do list. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Rest needs to to be on the top. We need to carve out time and space for rest, and and b- because we need to recover and restore the energy that it takes to do the things that we do in life. Because uh, again, we're human. So one of the things I just, I suppose I want to just put out there for the audience, and this is one I'm working on myself, is include that in your New Year's resolutions because that is hard to do, to carve out time for rest, um, you know, to carve out time to connect, carve out time to play, um, have fun. Uh, but, yeah, um, make these goals for, or make them part of your goals at least. Uh, yeah, that would be what I'd. Yeah, want to share, and that's definitely something I'm working on. Particularly, I'm doing a lot better on the rest and 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 connect part. I since becoming uh, recovering from burnout and and continuing on my well being. Um, the one that I'm not doing so well at is the play and the fun, uh, yeah. and so that's going to be on my reflecting and reviewing and setting. You know that my goals. Although I'm saying don't make them goals, but you know, but on my goal list to create fun, um, you know, create time and space for fun in my life. Um, but yeah, often I don't do. Yeah. And I feel like that's really important. And when you were talking about how sometimes you should take time to observe people around you, especially like younger people and just see how they literally don't have, they probably wouldn't have any goals in their mind. Like you were saying, while they're playing on a playground, um, I feel like having that time is really important where you don't have to think about anything, where you don't have to have an intention with what you're doing. You can just be present. I feel like that's something we really struggle with as we get older. Like that's something I struggle with a lot, just being present and feeling like I don't have to be actively doing anything with intention right now. Yeah, because somewhere along the lines, I don't, but uh, it became that adulthood required us to always be doing and and. Mm. Um, doing, yeah, just being on you know, goal achievement that somehow the the play, the fun, the just restoring and reconnecting, all those kind of things were um, pastimes, you know, only things yeah. children do. But actually the research is there that if we don't make this um, part of our regime, um, it does contribute to our um, emotional, mental and physical health. Um, you know, it, it contributes to chronic stress and chronic stress well, quite frankly, kills. Um, yeah. It does, but it definitely harms. It leads to things like depression. It leads to things like autoimmune diseases. It, it just heart attacks, chronic um, heart disease. It's it, it's all there. It's all there. Um, and these things will help buffer. But I know we find it very hard to do as adults because we live in a culture that actually says that there are only things that kids do. That it's lazy. It's you know, it's not success. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, it's 
it sucks that, you know, society doesn't see this as fundamental, but we can be the game changers. That's how I kind of see it. I'm like, well, I'm part of the game changing and, and I, that's part of my personality. I like kind of, I don't mind being off the beaten track and kind of doing things a bit different. Um, but yeah, so I know that might come easier to me than, than other people. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I feel like we've destigmatized a lot today with our conversations and just hopefully, you know, you've been able to give people the resources they need, which I feel like you have. We've talked about so many different things and, um, we've, gone off a bit of on some tangents which is always nice and we've discovered some new things which was lovely so thank you so much for coming on today and chatting with me about this topic I've genuinely really enjoyed it because I feel like we don't really get to talk about this especially new year's resolutions it's something you just do it's not really something you talk about yeah no it's been uh, I've really enjoyed it as well Joanna thank you uh like yeah I really feel like there's so much richness that has come out of our conversation yeah and really deep dived into New Year's resolutions yeah. and sort of pulling it apart to help people out there um, become more resilient and and hopefully successful in theirs as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, thank you for having me on to talk about this in, important topic as well. Of course, it's been my pleasure. Now I'm sure people will be wanting to find out a bit more about you. So where can they go to do that? Well, the easiest place to go to is my website, which is www.burnoutpsychologysupport.com. Because there I have, you know, my links to my podcast, When Burnout Becomes Reality, uh, to a book that I have out now, which is my own burnout to recovery journey called Nothing Left to Give. And uh, and I also write a blog now um, for Psychology Today called Lessons from a Burnt Out Psychologist. So um, capturing some important, um, you know, learnings, but also, yeah, just sharing my wisdom through that as well. So it's a great and also the services that I offer, which is Australian residents, unfortunately, only because of my registration. So I can't um, work outside of working for um, Australian residents. But definitely those other services, you know, the podcast and stuff is for everybody out there as well um, across the world. So, yeah, that's how you can um, yeah check in with what I'm up to. Um, and also, you know, my um, your contact details too if you need to reach out. Great. Well, thank you so much again, Shannon. My pleasure. Thank you, Joanna. Great. So to everyone listening, if you didn't get that, we've got all the description details down below. And yeah, to everyone watching, thanks so much for tuning in. Happy holidays. And I hope everyone has a lovely New Year's. You have been listening to Bouncing Back, the personal resilience science insights podcast produced by the Life Management Science Labs. Listen to episodes from LMSL's 10 Life Management Perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or other podcasting apps on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it and us grow to bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, pr.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Joanna. Thanks for tuning in.